All right, you may be seated. You may be seated. Uh, tonight we'll be in Luke chapter uh, 10. Uh, the first part of it is some familiar language. Uh, the second part is a couple of things that Jesus taught that we're very familiar with uh, when he talked about the greatest commandment and uh, also the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so hopefully uh, we're going to get through all of that tonight. And so if you will, uh, and you have your Bibles uh, and you're ready, we're in Luke chapter 10, and I'll start in verse 1. It says, uh, the Lord now chose 70, and some of your Bibles say 70 disciples, some translate say 72, 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he had planned to visit. Now, if you remember from the last chapter, he had already sent out the disciple, but he didn't send out nothing but the 12. Now, this time he's sending out the 70 uh, or 72, depending on uh, the translation you're using. Uh, and, and he paired them up just like he did the last one. And, and I want you to look at these guys as being his advanced team, advanced team, we would call in the military. They were going out and preparing the places uh, where he was going to visit. And they was going out before him. And, uh, and basically, we're going to see that he gave them later on the same instructions that he gave the 10, you know, as far as what to take and, and the things they were supposed to be doing. And so some of that's going to be familiar for us. So now you get this picture that Jesus now has expanded his network of disciples that he was commissioning, sending out. You know, these are the sent ones, okay? And so apparently these people may have been with him long enough to understand uh, what he was all about, his assignment, his mission, and he could entrust them to go ahead of him to prepare the way. And now he says, look at this, he says, verse 2, these were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest, the Lord who is in charge of the harvest, and ask him to send more workers to his, into his field. Now, Jesus used the analogy uh, uh, and compared the work that they was having to do to a harvest. Now, when you think of a harvest, what do you think about it? You know, I know all of us are not farmers, but we're familiar with that language, harvest time, especially during this time of the year because in a lot of places, this would be the harvest season for certain type of crops. And so, therefore, when you think about that and you're looking at him talking about a harvest, if you think about that in the natural, this was corn season or whatever season it may be, you can imagine what a cornfield would look like right about now. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was harvest time. You'll see stalks everywhere. You know, everything would be ready for the picking. Uh -huh. and, and, and so now, even though he's talking about a harvest, he ain't talking about corn. He's talking about people. So he's saying now, we have to see the world that we live in and the people as all presenting an opportunity for us to go out into the harvest. And he's saying there is no shortage of folks that need to be saved. It's just a shortage of folks who want to go out there and reach them. So, so that's why he says now we have to pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into the field. So, so now each one of us have an assignment, have a responsibility to try to reach out to somebody that don't know the Lord. And we have to see them as people, but in, in this analogy, see them as a grain, a stalk of corn that's ready to be plucked. And if you start thinking down that line, and then now maybe we will have a mindset that we won't miss opportunities to minister to somebody, to witness to someone to speak to someone because we will all be thinking in the same mindset. There's a harvest out there where people who need to know Jesus don't know him. And he is sending us now to go out into that harvest and bring, us up and bring others in. We have that assignment. So therefore, a lot of time we think about seeking and saving the lost and evangelizing the lost. We often see that it's just certain people with certain titles. But everybody that's saved can reach out to someone that's not saved. If in our circles, in our families, in our areas of influence, you know, we can do that. So now look at this. He said, but we got to pray. And I think sometimes we, we don't pray enough for the harvest. We just assume they're going to roll in. But maybe we got to pray a little bit more 
for the harvest and pray that God would, would, would send more workers. You know, it's only so much you can do with so many people. And even in the church today, you know, things would be easier if everybody would put their hand to the plow. You know, but there are some people, and you know, God bless them, they're growing, they're trying to learn. They absorb a lot of energy, but they don't put out no energy. So that makes the work harder for those who put out. A little bit of energy being put out is better than nothing. Amen. And I'm just of a believer that everybody in the church ought to be doing something. Something that God has gifted you to do and ta- given you the talent to do. Brother Fred, go ahead. I think a lot of times, Pastor, we look at the harvest, but we only look at, per se, our race. If we're, if we're a black workers in the harvest, we only look at that race, a white or, a white or whatever, instead of looking at everybody as being the harvest. We only look at our kind as being the harvest. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and therefore, when God brings people into our, you know, path and they don't need and they don't know Jesus, it should make us no different what color they are. I mean, they, they, now, now, and the intent is this. Whether they come to striving or not, it's not a big deal. Ideally, we will want everybody you reach to come to striving, but as long as they go somewhere, you know, as long as they go somewhere, Brother Major. Uh, but Pastor, uh, think about what uh, Fred said. So you look out into the harvest, but the, let's say the cornfield. All the cornfield ain't ready to be plucked, though. So, so <laughs> I mean, don't you have to be discreet some way? Well, well you know, you, you the, know the, the, mean, bottom, the bottom line, he said the harvest. So, so in my mind, Major, I'm thinking that <laughs> whether or not they accept the plucking, it ain't on us. If they ain't saved, they need to be plucked. I mean, they, something need to be planted into them. I mean, even though we recognize, you know what? Okay, I, I guess. <laughs> so, cause it'll be wrong for us to try to say, well, Major ain't ready yet. It, I don't think he's ready, so I ain't gonna go and talk to him. But, but, but we, he ready cause he don't know Jesus. Major may go to sleep tonight and don't wake up. And you had an opportunity to say something to Major today. I mean, that would be that would be that would be great if we knew everybody, or if we knew if we knew other situation as we crossed their path. But we don't know that. You know what I mean? I mean, we're looking out into this this field of people. Do you think it's okay for us to go? to everybody, not knowing their situation. So I would think it would be the, probably start with the people closest to us and then people that we know. Well, you know, in the strategies of outreach and evangelism, they, you know, they got a strategy to say, you start with relationships, start with people that you have something in common with and you already know, your circle of influence. But then as you get outside of your circle, you start uh, ministering based upon people that you have similar interests. You may not necessarily know them, but you do the same thing together. You may go to a golf course every week and see the same people out there going to tee off at the same time. Y'all got that in common. Right. And from conversation with them, you may find out, hey, man, this guy don't know Jesus. You know, this is an opportunity for me to share the gospel with him while we're getting ready to go tee up. I'm gonna so, so there's opportunities out there for it, but I, I don't think that uh, when it comes to us going out, we don't need to be timid. And, and I'm not telling you to walk around and beat folks up with your Bible and everybody in your office got to know. They ought to know you're saved whether you got your Bible or not. There ought to be a certain characteristic about certain things about you that let people know that you're saved. But at the same time, we have to be bold enough to carry the gospel because the disciples here are going to be told in a minute, hey, this ain't going to be easy, boys. That's right. I'm sending you out there. And you know, I'm going to send you out into a, a territory that, you know, sheep in the midst of wolves. Right. Okay. Let me read this next chapter and this next verse, and then we can go from there. Say, now look. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Now, Jesus was telling them, hey, look, guys, you know, it's a good possibility. Good possibility. Y'all going to be a little vulnerable. Amen. You know, sheep are kind of defenseless animals, you know. 
and I'm sending you out here in this world, and everybody that you go to minister to and go to witness to, they ain't going to want to hear it. Some of them are going to chew you up and spit you out. Some of them may even cuss you out. Some of them may say, don't even bring that subject up to me again. But he got a solution for them too. And you know, he got a solution. But the solution is not for us to cower down and not say anything. The solution is that, hey, their blood won't be on my hand. If the Lord sent me to them and he gave me this person and they came across my, in my spirit and then I do what he told me to do and they refuse the offer, they refuse the plan, then I could walk away and say, God, I've done what you called me to do and maybe all I was designed to do was plant a seed, somebody else going to come along and water it and then you're going to get an increase anyway. But at the same time, if I don't do it, God, I don't know what may happen to that person tonight. And I would want to have their blood on my hand, knowing that you placed them on my heart, knowing that you brought them across my path. But I think a lot of times, once we get saved and get confident in the church, we hear that term evangelizing and evangelism, and we think that that's just a certain office of people in the church who do that, instead of all disciples, all followers of Christ, are supposed to be able to reach out to others and share the gospel. Yes, Sister Mary, you got a mic? No, sir. Um, I, um, to me, um, like being an evangelist or a missionary, what you're talking about, th that's a title, but you can still do those things because I, I went on mission group, mission, missions in other countries, and, and, and we lost missionaries along the way, but I don't consider myself a missionary. I, I, I went on medical missions and everything. I, I consider myself just just Mary. And even um, as in evangelizing, um, like the Lord placed me in a, on a job where my second week there, the doctor told me that um, him and a group of other doctors and some people in this area, they at 9.38 a.m. and 9.38 p.m., we all stop what we're doing and say a prayer based on Matthew 9.38. The laborers are few mm -hmm. and 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 we supposed to pray for laborers and so that to me that and that gave me that open door and on my job to do what god called me to do in these past few weeks i haven't prayed i mean i paid pray for so many people because that door is open and 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 i'm not i don't call myself evangelist i'm just, right at that moment i'm a nurse but i'm still sister mary no matter where i go and and I, i'm not beating nobody over the head with it i ask them um, and do they want me to pray with them when they come in, or, you know, if they're going through certain things. And so, but, but we still call, regardless, like you're saying, to, to carry the word. Amen. And, and so I tell people all the time, don't get so caught up about the title and the offices that we have in the church as, as, uh, as much as the function that you're carrying out, you know. And, 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 and uh, uh, that's where we get this term missionary from because Jesus sent them out on a mission. So people that normally, in some big church organization, like you're saying, Send people out on mission trips. They go to countries that, that is depressed countries that need the gospel, and they go over there specifically on mission trips to carry goods, to be there, to show the love of Christ, but at the same time to evangelize those nations, those people, to try to win them over to Christ. Well, our mission field is right here in our midst. I mean, we got a mission field right here in Fort Walton Beach and Crestview and in the surrounding area. There are people right here. We ain't got to go to Haiti. I mean, if you want to go, let me know. But we ain't got to go. It's right here in our backyard. Mm -hmm. People that we work with, people that we know, people in our family. I mean, the mission field is right here. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we just got to do, we had to become conscious of that and on purpose say we're going to reach out to people. We're going to try to share the love of Christ with those people with the intent of bringing them to the Lord. And some of the people may already know. You may be surprised. Everybody's not totally ignorant of who Jesus is. Some people have just been in a state where they've been in and then they done fell out and kind of backslid and they just may need a word of encouragement from them. You know, they already know. But then there are some people who, who don't know and there are some people going to be argumentative. Don't want to know, but they're going to argue the whole point. Well, like I say, Jesus gives us an example here in a few minutes of what you do. You, you know, you just kind of kick the dust off your shoes. So now look at this. Let's read on. Look, he says, he said, now, those of you who were with us before, y'all should remember this from the last chapter. He says, now, don't take any money with you. No travel bags, traveler's bags, 
nor any extra pair of sandals, and don't stop and greet anyone on the road. Now that sounds kind of Jesus sounding. <laughs> Maybe I had to go back and read that a little bit longer, you know, because I, I said, man, Jesus sounds like he's telling to be rude to people and all that. He's really not telling to be rude. Brother Herb, he's not telling to be rude. He's just saying, look, the mission that I'm sending you on is so urgent and so important. I don't need you to be trying to pack for two weeks. And you got to haul all these suitcases around through the airport trying to get to somebody. I don't, I don't need to carry all that with you. You know, I, I, I don't need to have that. You know, I, I, you know, you know how you go on a weekend trip. You know, you carry that little bag and you got enough overnight and you do what you got to do. And Jesus said, now look, and you ain't got time to be out there just shooting the breeze. That's what he's saying. He ain't saying don't be rude. He said, don't let Major hold you up in a conversation talking about something that don't amount to nothing. You know, Major, you're on a mission trip, and Major now want to talk about the election. The election over. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Major want to hold a, a golf conversation with me, and I'm on a mission trip. So he's saying, look, he ain't saying be rude to people. He just said don't get sidetracked and start talking about stuff that ain't got nothing to do with what your assignment involved. But, but it don't sound like it. He said don't and don't stop to greet. So, so, when you, so when you hear the term greet, Fred, what does that mean? Hey, Fred, how's it going? I mean, wouldn't you think that? Yeah. You say, oh, well, he's on the way to the big house. <laughs> he said, don't stop. Don't stop. <laughs> don't, that word greet, that probably means a little bit more than just, hey, major, hi and bye. You know, greetings during that time when the people greet each other, you know, they do the hugging, they do, you know, they do the whole nine yards. It ain't like we just pass by some, but those people, when they greet, they go through a ritual. We, you know, we just fit them up and keep going. Those folks hug each other, do the double kiss and all that kind of stuff. So he's saying, look, you know, you ain't got time. If they, if they ain't your target... Just high and keep on going, Major. Major ain't my target. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to reach over here. So I ain't got time for Major to come and hold me in no conversation that ain't got nothing to do with the gospel. And see, sometimes that's what happens is we get sidetracked when we're supposed to be doing one thing for the Lord and we get sidetracked and doing something else and we miss opportunities to, to minister to someone who really need to hear the gospel. You know, because this is not the time to be arguing with somebody trying to defend the gospel. You know, because there's some people just want to argue with you. But this, I, I ain't trying to argue with you to win the case right now. The, the harvest, there, there's some folks out there that's ready. You ain't ready. But the harvest is ready. There's some people out there who are ready to hear what you got to say. And those are the ones that he wants us focusing on. Not somebody you're going to just have to go and argue for three or four days with. And then now you done missed ten folks that was ready to give their life to Christ. You know, I mean, I'm just telling you with Jesus, but man, if we take him literally, Major, Jesus was, Jesus was kind of, you know, Brother Herb, go ahead. I'm just, give, no, I'm just giving a, an example for, <clears throat> I'm just thinking about the times when we get assigned to go on a mission. <clears throat> and when we have to fly. When we fly and go into a mission, there are certain stops that we have to go. And some of them stops, it's a real nice place to say, hey, why don't we just mingle here for a moment? You know, it's, you know uh, and we ain't got time to do that. The only time we got to do is go on and get our gas, get what we have to get, our supplies, get back on the airplane, and go to the mission. So I'm just saying is that we ain't got time to say, hey, man, this is a nice place to sit and just mingle a little bit. No, we ain't got time to shop and mingle. We got to go to the mission. That's just what Jesus is saying. And, we ain't got time to, you know, we ain't got time to. to and, and, and working in the command post in the Alpha, yeah. I was in the Alpha, I know what you're talking about. You know, it, crew for love for their planes to break in nice location. You know, they got, a, they got a leak, and, you know, we, we're going to land here in, in, in Spain. So, therefore, hey, we broke. We can't go. Well, man, you got a mission to do. You better get that plane and get off the ground. But they want to, that certain places, yeah, I guess they're saying, like, some of us like, would like to break down in the wrong place when God is sending us to something on a mission. We're on a mission. He's given us an assignment, and it's not time for us to be being casual about it. But, but sometimes we can be so mission-focused mission. We, 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 could, we could be so focused on, let me, I gotta get here, I gotta get here. I 
gotta get to church. Church starts at 10 o'clock. And we'll ride right by somebody. Well, that's different now, mate. Don't, don't, don't mix apples and oranges now. Let me no. stick to my first point. Then. <laughs> this thing called mission focus that we miss a need somewhere. Can, can we not? Yeah, we can. We're going to see that later with the Good Samaritan. That, that's a little bit different. We're going to see that. But, but here specifically, Jesus talked about going out into the harvest, reaching lost souls. See what I'm saying? And, 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 and now sometime... In the case of the Good Samaritan, we're going to see later, they should have diverted from that mission because there was a more pressing mission right there before them. You know, sometimes, you know, Brother Herb, you know, they call them ad hoc targets. That was my primary, but this target popped up on, on the scope, and we need to take it out on the way to the other mission. Okay, I hope I'm making sense. Brother Herb done brought that airplane thing in here. Okay, so look at this. He said now, so whenever you enter someone's home, first say, May God's peace be on this house. In other words, extend peace or blessing on the house that you're entering in. And if those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. In other words, if they receive you with kindness and they're peaceful, he says, what you say will stand. The blessing that you speak on that family, that house will stand. But if they are not, the blessing will return to you. So they were told to go to certain people houses and once they found a house that was peaceful and willing to receive them he tells them next time stay there as long as you're in that region you stay at one place don't be jumping from house to house because if you don't find someone that's going to accommodate you and do the things that's necessary for you to be successful don't jump around so every day you got to real stab where am I going to sleep tonight that's the instruction. Now, again, I don't believe there was no long, year-long mission because they didn't tell them to take much, just like last time. They went out to regions around the area where he was going to go and preach. Okay? And so now, so look, he says, he says, if those who live in the house are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing will return to you. Now, look here. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide you. Now, I'll stop it there. Eating and drinking what they provide you. Stay in one place. Now, the question would have been asked is, boy, what if they went to an area and someone offered them something that was outside of the Jewish dietary law? In other words, Major, I'm on a mission and you have shown me hospitality. And I'm coming to your house. And for breakfast, you bring me some bacon and eggs. Should I say to you, Major, don't you know I can't eat no bacon? Or should I say, Major soul is more important to me than the dietary law? If I bless the bacon, and it don't kill me, I ought to be all right. Now, I wouldn't eat it on my own normally, but since he's sending me to these people's house, they done showed me hospitality, and they didn't give me no menu to pick from. Should I say, ah, oh, man, I can't, I can't eat that. And that's the, that'll defile you. That's food from the devil. That's what you're saying? And, and I believe that's what Jesus was telling them. Don't lose sight of the mission over something that is not detrimental to your salvation. Yes, sir. I mean, yeah, under normal circumstances, nah. But to save your soul, I'll make the sacrifice. Because yes, I believe God will honor that instead of me getting caught up in my dietary habits. Yes, that makes sense to everybody? Okay. Now, now look, he says, says, so he says, if, if you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever they set before you, none. Then he says, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. In other words, do a good work and then preach the kingdom. Don't get sidetracked doing other things. Do the good work and then let them know that the kingdom, God's plan for their salvation and eternal life, that kingdom is near to them. Why? Because I have the kingdom message. You got the kingdom message. You got the message that can ensure that they enter into God's kingdom. Amen. 
And, and, and Jesus was giving them this, these instructions because we all have that message. We can talk about the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Because once we're going to see this again, play it out in Luke, that played out in John. If you really want to know God, you got to know Jesus. That's right. And if you know Jesus, by default, you know God. See, and we see this pattern, this trend. So our, that's why our focus as Christians, man, we got to be focused on him. It got to be about him and not about us. Because he is the one who revealed to us who God is by what he taught, by how he lived. And, and, and even, even these little parables, these little stories that he tells, they're telling us something about God. Amen. Okay? He says, now look. He says, but if a town refuses to welcome you, Go out into the streets and say, <laughs> we wipe even the dust of your town from our feet to show you that we have abandoned you to your own fate. In other words, you refuse the gospel. I've done my job. The way he said it earlier, you just kick the dust off your feet. And that's just like saying, hey, look, I've done what I'm supposed to do. If you don't want to hear it, I'm not going to force you to receive something you don't want. Right. And so therefore now, I'm going to tell you what is the consequence for your not accepting this plan. And after I tell you that, then I'm going to turn you over to you, and I'm going to have my conscience clear because now your blood will not be on my hands. I've done what the Lord told me to do. I can't make you accept the gospel. I can't make you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. All I can do is share that with you, but if you refuse it, that's on you. And that could be for any of our family members, man, that we done been witnessing to and talking to. And they know we saved. And you're trying to share that with them, and they don't refuse it. They refuse it. Then you can say, God, I did what I was supposed to do. So if something happened to them and, 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 and they die, I hope ain't nobody get up, got to get up there and fabricate that, 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 you know. You don't been no funerals like that. You don't know what to say, and you have to make up a salvation story on the day of the funeral. Too late. At what point do you give up on people? I, I don't think you never give up on people, man. You never know. I, and I think that's one thing, even though I don't like the concept of deathbed confession, I know in the Catholic Church that's big. Because they, they're, they're saying, Grandmama at 99 years old may have not accepted all her life, but when we come in, this priest come in the last breath, and she decides she's going to accept Jesus, she good as gold. Good as go. It's almost no different than when Jesus was on the cross and one of the, um, the criminals. Amen. I mean, I mean he, was, he was approaching him being di dying. <laughs> he said, hey, don't forget about me. He said, as this day. I Amen. Mean, Amen. As this day. And, and so, so as long as there's breath, there's hope. Right. I'm just telling you, don't wait till the last minute. You don't know when the last minute is going to come. Mm -hmm. I won't vote. If you get it now, fine. But, you know, if I can get it, catch you before you take your last breath, yeah, I'm going to pray for you. Right. But, 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 boy, I sure wish we could have got you earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, your life may have been better, and you may not even be here now. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like Brother Herb is saying, you know, and it's not about works. So we know that. So obviously, they don't have to work to be saved. Our salvation is based upon us believing in something, not doing something, Amen. going out to work. Because that person, on that thief on the cross, didn't get an opportunity to go and do any great work. Fred looked like you. Fred looked like you. Yeah, yeah Pastor, but, but you know, you, you shouldn't wait to that deathbed confession. And, and the reason I say that is because are you accepting him now out of fear of where you might end up at? Are you accepting him because you really love and, 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 and want, want, want to be with him? Are you just scared now? So, you know, a lot of scared people say a lot of things that they don't really mean. 
Well, I think some folks who ain't dying get scared. <laughs> you know, you heard somebody preach that hellfire and brimstone message to you. You know, I tell you, look here, you're going to wake up where they're going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and you're going to burn throughout eternity, and the worms going to, man, hey, yeah, give me some Jesus. <laughs> give me, I didn't come to church to get that, but someone, someone laid all that before me. So, I, yeah, I want a little bit of that Jesus. I want, a, I want an insurance policy. But, but, I, but for me, Fred, I'm glad I, I didn't wait till the last minute. And I'm glad that none of my kids waited till the last minute. I'm hoping my grandkids follow the lead of their parents and don't wait till the last Amen. minute. Amen. That, that's, that's not the way to have our families to live. Amen? Now look at this. He says, in verse 12, he says, I assure you, even wicked Sodom, Sodom will be better off than such a town on Judgment Day, a town that had, you know, what y'all know about Sodom? Y'all, everybody know the Sodom and Gomorrah story, right? You know that word Sodom, that's where we get sodomy from. Yes, they they were doing some ugly things in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, we took that word right out of the Bible. For uh, that's sodomizing. That's where it comes from, sodomy. Used to be a time that was was against the law. Amen. It was practice Sodom against the law. You know, now, you know, the laws have changed, but the Bible ain't changed. So, but now get this. He's saying Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. But he says at Judgment Day, Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be better than these folk. Now, you know, that's just serious. This is a serious indictment against you. You say, Major, at Judgment Day, God destroyed Sodom, and they're going to have a better chance than you. And he was telling these people that because you all saw the true Savior. They didn't. You guys have been exposed to something that they were never exposed to. And you have heard it and don't believe it. Man, you're going to catch hell on Judgment Day. Is that making sense to everybody? Yeah, you know, so, yeah, man, I mean, yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't like talking about that today. Used to be a time that used to be a part of teaching. Right. We skip those parts of the Bible now. Because, you know, we don't want to offend nobody. But a lot of things we do here in a few minutes, we're going to see the Good Samaritan law came right out of the Bible. I'm going to ask you that in a few minutes. Y'all think about that. Came right out of the Bible. So there are a lot of things that is in our culture, in our society, at one time was practiced because it was in the Bible. But as our culture changed and people got away from the Bible and they go to church to be entertained, then they don't no longer know what the Bible say. So now something that someone can say that can sound good, but it may be an error, but because it was said in church, I believe it. That's why you got to be here on a Wednesday night or whatever night to study this Bible, show yourself approved. You just can't take what folks say on Sunday. Amen. So, 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 so now he said, now look, I assure you that even Sodom will be better off than such a town on judgment that refused them. He says, what sorrow awaits? And he called two towns here, Chorazin and Bethesda. For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of the, sin, of the sins long ago clothing themselves in burlap or, or sackcloth and throwing ashes on their heads to show their deep remorse. He said, look, man, if I have done so much in y'all presence, if these other cities had seen a little bit of what I've done, they would have repented. Right. And I've been coming to you all this time. I've been around you and y'all been going to all these people all this time and they have not accepted this gospel. And he says, now look, man, other people would have seen less miracles and repented. And y'all done seen all the things I've been doing and still didn't repent. That's right. Man, he said, it's going to be rough on you <laughs> on Judgment Day. See, when we, when we repent, man, we're supposed to feel sorry for what we've done. That's right. Amen. We don't go and sit around in ashes and burlap, you know, because those just symbols, you know, but, but they remind you. 
You know, if maybe, you know, we don't practice stuff like that in the Bible. We would be called crazy. But say for us, man, if you committed a sin major and you had to walk around all day with a burlap bag on, can you imagine what you feel like all day long scratching? And, you know, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do that but one time. You know, we had to all put on burlap every time we did sin and had to walk off off in here with your burlap bag on. I mean, we'll stop sinning or we'll start lying. One or two. We'll, we'll, stop, we'll stop sinning. And you had to haul, I mean, if you had to just come to church with your burlap on. That's right. Yeah, I mean, just the thought of that. But now, we don't need burlap. The Holy Spirit is supposed to do that. Amen. When we do wrong now, the Holy Spirit is supposed to deal with us in a way that we feel sorry for what we've done. And, wanna, and we want to, it will cause us to want to repent. And to be deeply sorry for what we've done. That's what that word remorse means. He says, now look, yes, Tyre and Sidon, and Sidon will be better off on judgment day than you. And you people of Capernaum, that was a place that Jesus spent a lot of time. It was like a home base for him. Will you be honored in heaven? He says, no. You will go down to the place of the dead. Man, that's serious. The place of the dead, you know, some of the Bible talking about Hades, uh, 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 the place where people are going to be tormented, tortured forever, you know, wherever that is, what we want to call the hell, because I know nowadays when you say hell, that's a bad word in church. Used to be a time hell was common language in church on Sunday. Now we act like we'd rather say another curse word than to say hell. I hear preachers saying other curse words, but they won't say hell. Hell. Because we don't want folks to think that they can go to hell. Unless we're angry with somebody and we tell them, get out of our face, you better go to Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll throw it out there like that. Right? But, but when you're talking preaching to somebody on a Sunday, if you don't get your life right, you're going there. I ain't going back to that church. I don't want to hear nothing about no hell. I want to hear how to, how to be successful. How to get to the top. I want a message that's going to make me feel good. Reverend Bowden got me talking about going to hell. I ain't. I, I ain't going to hell. I, I ain't going back to striving because they, they over there preaching hell, fire and brimstone. Well, used to be when we came up, that we knew we were going to get a little bit of that every other Sunday. We went, they, the old preachers didn't run away from the hell message. Nowadays, we, we have to work with y'all psychology. You know, psychologically, y'all can't handle someone tell you going there. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Bowden cursed too much. He said hell too many times. Why well, he say the donkey word? That's in the Bible too. Brother Herb, go ahead. You like you didn't say something? Well, you know, one of the things about about when you say somebody's going to hell. They can't handle the conviction because that's, that's what it's saying. That you're going to hell, that means you've been, you know, you are convicted and they can't let that go. They, the, the, the conviction thing, and, and, and that's in front of them when you tell them that they're going to hell. And, it, 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 and so they don't have a strong understanding or can't handle the convicted part. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a teaching out there now, like I say, that they got purely away from the doctrine of, you know, hell. You're going somewhere. So, so because that message don't sell. And, you know, when, when the church became uh, commercialized, meaning that there was a time we didn't sell merchandise in the church for the most part. We didn't sell merchandise. But when pe preachers started to market in their name, and branding their names, they started producing tapes and CDs in their name. So that's why you go to church now. If you want to, you can buy a CD or you can buy whatever, download this, that, and the other. And so when my marketing people come and tell me that that message that you preached two weeks ago on hell still sitting on the shelf, ain't nobody bought that one. So now I'm more concerned about my Sales and my brand getting out there 
I ain't going to mess with that hell message right now. I got to get back over here to what's leaving the shell, what they want to hear about. <laughs> success, how to do this, how to do that. I, I'm all for success. Christian ought to be successful. But there's a way to be it. Amen. Amen. And, and so what I'm trying to tell you, because the church has become more influenced by the world and the world being influenced by the church, the world has kind of crept into the church. Because the people who get saved come out of the world. But if we don't present the gospel to them in its pure form, then what will happen is the gospel will get diluted and it loses power. And that was never the intent. Jesus wanted the gospel to be watered down. Yes, there's a way to present message. You don't have to beat people with the word, but the spirit is going to convict folk anyway if they really want to grow and want to mature in the things of God and not fight God. You know, that's why I tell people, even when I was a secular world instructor, I could tell in students, they taught us how to tell students who come to the class just to argue with you and refute everything you say. So when they used to make us open up our class, I say, I hope you're here to listen, to understand, and not to refute. Then we open all our class, because we know that we're going to be a major sitting out there on the edge. Ready to say, I don't agree with that. Hey, right. Wait a minute, I'm the instructor. I got the lesson plan. I know what the Bible say. You the student. So now if I was worrying about major arguing with me, then I'd get away from my lesson plan and teach major something that he want to hear. And so this thing that we see here, these people were close to Jesus. This was a place where he had a camp. And man, he told them, hey, you know, when someone asks a question, and you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? And what he said, no. You will go down to the place of the dead. Well, y'all go do your own research on that. Well, if I got to go down, I'm going in the wrong direction. That's right. After I die. We, we want to go. Amen. Even though this old fleshly body go down, the spirit is supposed to be going in another direction. Amen. Amen. So now look, he says, now, now look. He says, then he said to the disciples, anyone who accepts your message will be accepting me. He connected the message to himself. That's right. And there's no way for people to accept a message that is not about Jesus. Sooner or later, the, when we teach at church, we got to talk about Jesus. We can't go to church for months and don't never mention Jesus. Amen. I mean, we, we don't have to throw his name out there every Sunday, but somehow he ought to be intertwined in the word and, and the message that people know who we're talking about. Shouldn't be no doubt in folks' minds when they come to a church that's called a Christian church that the star is Jesus. Amen. Amen. And whenever that's confused, then now... People leave there with a, with a misunderstanding of what the gospel is about. The good news is about Jesus Christ. He says, now look. He says, anyone who accepts your message is accepting me. And anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting Man, he make a whole line of connection there. He connected us all the way back to himself and God. So when we reject Jesus, Jesus said, you're rejecting the Father. Right. And when you accept me, even though you don't know much about the Father, when you accept me, you accept him, because I'm going to reveal to you who he is. Amen. That relationship that Jesus got with the Father, man, is one that we, a lot of times, we can't phantom that relationship in our own mind, but what we have to do is understand that, hey, let me just phantom and concentrate on Jesus. If I pattern myself after Jesus and try to live like he want me to live, I'm going to make mistakes here and there, but I'm trying to live like him, I guarantee you he's going to point me in a direction that leads to God. Now look at this. When the 70 came back, he says, when the 72 returned, disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use who? Your name. That's the name. His name. Not Bolden. 
You don't use my name. You use, and, and see, you know, preaching now has become a personality contest. And there are a lot of people who know more about the personality of the preacher that they listen to than they know about Jesus. And preaching that don't lead you to Jesus is leading you to man. And so therefore, what happens is, when that happens, then now preaching, preachers can go out and get their own little cult following. Because once a person starts listening to you and not studying, then they don't discern what you're saying. They just accept it at face value. Instead of being like the Bereans and going home and study for themselves. Now they was excited. Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Power in that name. That's why I, I have a hard time with Christians who think that they can be possessed by demons. Now, I ain't got no problem. You believe that. If you believe that one day you can be walking down the street and an old boy going to just jump on you and get inside you and live. If that's what you want to believe, knock yourself out. But if these guys had some power, we got the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. We ought to have some power. Amen. Now, I don't mind a demon attacking you. We in warfare. He can attack you. I ain't got no problem with that. But don't come to me talking about he, he living in me. No, wait a minute. If he living in you, that means the Holy Spirit gone. Because both of them can't live in the same house. But if you don't know that and someone tell you that, then now you got a lot of Christians who walking around thinking that, man, I go to church every Sunday and I'm demon possessed. What? How can you be demon possessed and you got the Holy Spirit? That's right. So there's a difference between being possessed and attacked. Mm -hmm. Now, if you buy into that and think you can be possessed, I ain't going to argue with you. That's, you. that's your belief. And then you're going to be seeing demon behind every door. You know, you... You go to the hotel on the 15th floor. You will open the hotel room or you think there's a demon in here somewhere. Man, if he isn't there, you brought him with you. I mean, I'm just saying, some people just focus on demon, 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 and we give them too much credit, man. These boys came back shouting. Man, when you got authority over somebody, you don't have to talk about them all the time like they got you under control. You got them under control. Oh, man, I hope I ain't upset nobody. Please, if you're online, please forgive me. But I'm just reading what it said. He said, look, you know, they was surprised. They was happy and joyful because the demons obeyed them in his name. He says, yes, he told them. I saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning. And I don't know, that passage there is kind of troubling because it looked like he's saying, while you was out there doing what you was doing, I saw the power that y'all had over him. And what he was looking like falling. Now some think that that was talking about when Satan and his angels got kicked out of heaven. Right. You know, Jesus said, hey, I remember when he was up in heaven raising hell. And God said, hey, you know, y'all got to go. That's right. and, and God didn't give up the throne. The devil and his third got out of heaven. That's right. And now they're in earth. So what I'm trying to say is that we have a track record of God defeating the devil. Amen. And the Holy Spirit defeating the devil. So if that track record is true, then we should be defeating them too. He said, now look, look, I have given you authority, good God Almighty, over all the power of the enemy. Not some, all. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions. That's a reference to Psalms 91 there. Just talking about dangerous things. He ain't telling us to go out there and challenge God by just jumping on the snake bit. <laughs> that, that is what he's saying. Okay, I'm just going to believe God. I'm going to go walk out here in these snakes. In these bed of rattlesnakes. Now, you're going to probably die. In the name of the Lord, you're going to probably die. But I do believe, like Paul, when he put his hand in that fire and a viper clinged on to him, and everybody thought that he was a devil because the viper wasn't to kill him, and when he didn't die, they thought he was a god. So, so I do believe that God can protect us, but I don't believe God wants us to tempt him. Do We don't tempt God. Brother Herbert, you want to say something? No more than what you just got to saying. I mean, Jesus was, that was one of his tests. I, I can't tip, I can't tip to God. Won't you, right. jump, won't you jump up in this cliff and, and see uh, you, you, who will protect you? Yeah, the angel's going to catch you. You he said, jump, no, jump no. Yeah. No, I, 
Yeah, I can't. I can't tip my ball. No. <laughs> he just said, he just telling him what he knows. <laughs> Don't tempt the Lord. Amen. And so look at it, the, the verse 20, this is a powerful verse. We often get caught up on verse 19 and we, we, we miss verse 20. He says, this is what Jesus tells him, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Look, God Almighty, you're missing the point. If you're just happy because a demon obey you, you, you rejoice because your name are registered in heaven. Good God Almighty. That'll preach by itself, Major. Where is your name written? Ooh, man, where is your name written? You know, when I, when I look up at the, into the heavenly room of roll call, and they start calling roll, and I'm going to see, am I going to see Major Hine? Or Major Hine going to be scratched off the board? Oh, that's, uh, that's tough right there, man. Man, he said, look, y'all can shout, man, because you didn't accept the Jesus and you know your name is written in heaven. Man, your, your name is on record in heaven. So you ain't got to worry about when you die, where you're going. Your name is already recorded in heaven, all because you have accepted Jesus. We got to be worried about those folks whose name is not recorded. Therefore, that's why he's talking about we got to get out into this harvest and, and get out and minister to people. And we rejoice because we, when people get saved, not just because the demon obey us. Amen. And we, the Bible says we rejoice when one soul gets saved. Man, so Jesus, Jesus made a powerful point there in that, in that alone. But now, then, now, uh, he, in verse 21, he kind of transitioned into a prayer of thanksgiving. And look at it, he says, at that time, Jesus was filled with joy, the joy of the Holy Spirit. And, and he said, Our Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and revealing them to the childlike. He said, look, there are some people who think that they're so educated that they don't even need to know anything about God. And for those folk, God purposely don't let them know him. He don't reveal himself to them. But he's saying now, I thank you for real, revealing them to the child-like. When you come to God, you can't come to him like you know everything. Amen. You, you got to come to God like you are a child. That's right. Looking for him to teach you, to nurture you to show you the things that you need to do, not thinking you can tell him how life ought to go. That's right. So he says, man, because he revealed himself to those who come like that. He will make himself known. Even if he had to bring someone across your path that's going to help you understand or teach you how to read this word and understand this word, he will reveal himself to you. But when you come to him like you know it all, you're going to read the word and start arguing with him. That's right. I, don't, I don't agree with that. He just said that. I don't agree with that. Well, look here, you ain't a child. You know, where were you when he created everything? When he set the boundaries of the sea, where were you? Then now you're going to come to him. You don't agree with what he wrote, what he left? So it's important for us to come to God as a child. And that childlike faith ain't got nothing to do with how, when you first get saved. At now when we come to God, we ought to come to him with a childlike spirit. Even though we'll learn, we've learned some things, but we're never going to know more than he knows. Right. So therefore, we go to him with the right attitude, like we're willing to continue to learn. And you're going to be learning some things about God and his ways all the way till you die. I mean, you, you just ain't going to get it all. You're going to be learning all the way to the end. If you continue to apply yourself, you're going to be learning more and more about him. He says, yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. Now look at this. My father has entrusted everything to me, Jesus. No one truly knows the son, Jesus, except the father, God. No one truly knows Jesus but God. And no one truly knows the father, God, except the son. And those to whom the Son choose to reveal him. 
So if I want to know God, I better get in fall in love with the son. And when I come to the son with childlike faith and with a childlike spirit, he's going to reveal God. Amen. Good God of mine. And you don't have to go to seminary to get it, that revelation of some things about God. Amen. You just need to have the right attitude when you come to, you just need, man, there were people before our people could even go to school, people who were undereducated could read this Bible and get in tune with God better than some folks who had a higher degree in education and all that other stuff Amen. because they came with a knowledge that they know just as much as God. And as a result of that, God didn't reveal himself to them. Now, we got to have an open mind when it comes to this word, and we got to be willing to listen to the word and study the word and meditate on the word and not do it with an augmented spirit. Amen. Some things you just ain't going to figure out right now. And because you can't figure it out right now, don't get stuck. Amen. Just say, hey, God ain't revealed all that to me right now. But what I do know, I'm going to stand on that. Because this Bible, man, it, it, it is so rich and there's so much in it that no one person can exhaust us all. Amen. And so as you grow and as you study, the more you grow and the more you study, the more Jesus revealed to you who the Father is and how he does things. So look, he chose. The Son chooses to reveal him. Now look at it. He says, then when they were alone, he turned to his disciples and said, blessed are the eyes of that see what you have seen. Good God Almighty, you know. I tell you, look at this, many prophets and kings long to see what you see. Yes, sir. But they did not see it. In other words, they, they, they heard about a Savior and a Messiah coming. It was prophesied. They talked about it. They had some idea, but none of them saw it. They longed to see what you see. And because you see it, you ought to appreciate it much more than they did because they did not see it. Y'all got to get this, man. They longed to see what you see, and they didn't see it. And they longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. See, these folks back then, a lot of these folks, they didn't even have what you have now. That's right. You got God's written word. Amen. There were some people during this time, they didn't have it. They just had to believe what someone said. They didn't have it. We got the written word. We got folks who done went out there and studied this Bible, broke it down, Tell us what these words mean. Man, we got so much that can help us understand who God is, much more than these folks. We ought to be far more advanced than these folks were. Even though we have to walk by faith and not by sight, everybody that read some of these writings didn't see Jesus either. That's right. But now we have his record, man. We have what he said. And so therefore, it's up to us to receive that. It's up to us to accept that and then try our best to live by it. Look at this. Then, you know, I don't know, it was all this in the same conversation. This is where Jesus get into this conversation with the expert on religious law. Probably long, someone, when they talk about religious law, they're probably talking about someone who knew the law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets, those books in the Old Testament. And even in Judaism, the rabbis, they had what they call oral laws or oral traditions, meaning that in addition to what was written in the law by Moses and what was wrote by the prophets, these scholars sit around and wrote their commentary. And sometimes their commentary became like a law, even though it wasn't the law. And so these guys were taught. These was, he, this guy was educated. He had been taught on all this stuff. And so the Bible says he was a SME. Didn't that what that say, Finley? One day, an expert... In religious law, they, they, what they call them now, SMEs out there on the base. SME, subject matter. Yeah, SME. So there was, a, there was a SME in the Bible. This guy was a subject matter expert on the law. You know, and, and you know when you're talking to someone who got, who's an expert on the subject matter, they automatically think they know more than you. Because they're supposed to, right? They SMEs. But every now and then, a SME run up on the master. You know what I mean? It's kind of like little grasshopper. Y'all remember little grasshopper? You know, the grasshopper was bad, 
But the master wasn't going to tear grass off of everything he knew. Because he won't let grass off of no. You're never going to be the master. I'm going to teach you so much. But don't ever think you're the, you the master. We can't ever get to the point we think we God. Or we Jesus. And we know more than he knows. Even though we are highly educated and we got a lot more technology now, we can't never get to the point we think that we know more than the Lord. He says, look this. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, I'm, I've been hearing about this eternal life, and they, we talked about it in, in rabbi school in the Old Testament. We talked about this eternity thing. So what do I need to do to etern inherit eternal life? Jesus re replied, what does the law of Moses say, and how do you read it? Boy, that's a, man, I, when I first read this over 20 years ago, man, I highlighted this passage in my Bible, and to this day it just still rings in me. That little passage right there. What does the law of Moses say? And how do you read it? In other words, what does the Bible say and how do you interpret it? Because how you interpret it is going to determine how you act. And I guarantee you, we all read this Bible, but we don't all interpret it the same way. And I'm talking about scholars, people who don't been to higher levels of education and religious teaching than I have. We don't all interpret it the same way, but the Holy Spirit should be guiding us to the same truth. But he said, now look, he says, what does the law of Moses say and how do you read it? Now I can just say that about everything we just read from verse 1 all the way to verse 24. I'd have had a whole lot of commentary, made them ask some questions, Brother Herb done commented, that don't mean nothing. But it's important, how did you interpret what we just said? Because right. however you read it, however you interpret it, that's how you're going to apply it. And if you interpret that, 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 well, that ain't no big deal. Jesus really didn't mean that. Then you ain't going to do nothing with it. If you didn't buy into the harvest, it's right. I ain't interpret that way here. I didn't see that him telling me. I need to go out there and witness to nobody. I didn't interpret that that way. So you ain't going to do nothing with that. So when we come to church on Sunday, I always think, it don't make no difference what Pastor Bolden say. I can say whatever the words say, but it's important how do you interpret what is being said. How do you read it? And that's why it's important for you to read this Bible yourself and get an understanding so you will know how you read and apply what you have been taught and what you have read. Amen. This is what Jesus says. What does the law of Moses say? And, and these guys would have known the law of Moses because the first five books of the Bible, they would have known that. That's all they was brought up on for the most part. So he would have known that. But then he says, how do you read it? Look what the man said. The man answered from the law. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Wow. Man, that looked like to me, Finley. That God wants all of you. You know, like they say in the rap world, I got my mind on my money and my money on my. I got my mind on my God and my God on my mind. Now, look at, let me go back. You must love the Lord your God with all, not some, no divided loyalty, all your heart. All your soul, that deep internal part of you, all your strength, your power, your might, and all your man. Maybe, like I say, that'll preach right there by itself. You can take each one of them and talk about people's heart. Where is your heart at? How can you love God when your heart is hard? You won't accept it. You don't have a heart to love other people. How can you say you love God with all your heart? That part of you. That's supposed to be affectionate and show people love. You know, in your soul, how can you love God and, and you're always caught up in your feelings and emotions like that? Your soul just running you. I mean, just running you. You know, I, I just, you know, you're a Christian, somebody, you're always caught up in your feelings. Come on, y'all better hear me now. 
Because that's how folks come to church. Every Sunday they get cut, they leave church, get caught up in there. All your strength. I mean, I got to put some effort and energy into this relationship. And then with all my, man, I got to be thinking about this, God. I got to be meditating on this word. I mean, I got to put all of this into it. But we can't do that if we never put our mind on him. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm thankful all y'all here tonight and those online, y'all mind on him. But there's some people don't think about him but on Sunday morning. That ain't enough to win. Because he ain't got all your mind. He ain't trying to keep you from doing other things, but he's saying he still got to be the priority in your life. Amen. Now look at this. He said, now look. And then after he's talking about how you got to love God, you see him talking about how we love upward. Our relationship with God in heaven, how we love upward. Then you got to love your neighbor that's outward as you love who? Inward. So you see three dimensions. You got to love out, upward, outward, and inward. And if you don't have a good dose of loving you, you ain't going to love nobody else. Yes, you ain't going to love your neighbor if you don't care nothing about yourself. Man, if you abuse you, you're going to abuse somebody else. Amen. So he said, now look, he, he, Jesus get a boy credit. He says, right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. In other words, you're gonna, man, you can have eternal life on just that alone. Because if you love God like you love your neighbor and you love your neighbor like you love yourself, and if you love God with all your being, all your soul, all your spirit, all your mind, all your strength and all that, look here, you ain't going to go out there and cheat and, and, and mess with your, your neighbor's wife. Because you love him. You ain't going to go out there and steal from somebody. Because you love him. He's saying you can fulfill the law with just these two verses right here. Amen. Amen. You don't have to try to remember, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not, you know, have no other God before me. Just remember what he just said there, you cover all of them, thou shalt not. Because he told them, do this and you will live. live. Look here. He said, the young man wanted to justify his action. Now, I don't say the guy was bad, he just, you know, maybe he, he's an educated guy, he just want to justifies action, so he, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Good God Almighty. He should have quit while he was ahead. I mean, he should have quit. You know, that's what I told you. Somebody think they know more than the teacher. You done got a good question in, and you answer the question. Quit while you are. Don't try to stump the teacher. He the one that got to grade your paper. And you know, sometimes you're writing a paper, the teachers have a lot of leeway how they interpret what you're trying to write. Yes, sir. So if not, you don't got that embarrass him in class, and he grading your paper, he may remember that. Because it's subjective, you know, it's subjective. I don't like the way Finley said that. C minus. But if Finley, a major, I had been a humble student in class trying to absorb what I'm teaching, then I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. Let me move on. <laughs> he was ahead, Major. He had answered right. But then now Jesus got to tell him a story. Now, when Jesus tells his story, now you got to keep in mind this is a story. He's going to relate this to what something that they could understand based upon the climate and the culture that they was living in. And so he say, now the, the story is to answer the question, who is my neighbor. neighbor? So Jesus replied with a story. He says, a Jewish man. Somebody say a Jewish man. Jewish. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho. Y'all know this story. And he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him for dead beside the road. A Jewish man. One of their own kind. A Jewish man. Major, again, that's a three-part sermon right there. You know, he was attacked by bandits, stripped from his clothes, beat up, and left for dead. You know that if I was just messing with people emotions on a Sunday morning, I'd say, some of y'all coming in here, you was under attack before you got here. 
The enemy done beat you down all the week and done left you for dead. But you sitting in here on a Sunday morning so I can tell you that there's life still in you. I wouldn't do that, though, because you're down, you mess with some people's emotions. Everybody say, ooh, the pastor hit a nerve right there. I did get beat up on my job this week. I got some things. My wife gave me a hard time. You know that? And then I'm standing here, and I see that. You know, you can sense that energy coming there, and you stay there a little while long. Preach that point just a little while long, because the Holy Spirit say, that done hit a nerve with somebody. That word done penetrated somebody. Good preachers got to know how to read the room. Amen. When the Spirit reveals certain things to you while you're preaching, you got to know how to read the... Look at this. Stripped him of his clothes. Beat him up. That was a good old-fashioned mugging if he was in New York or somewhere. And left him half dead beside the road. Now look at this, Major. He said, by chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man laying there, he crossed on the other side of the road and passed, by, passed him by. A religious leader who was a Jew himself saw another Jew laying on the side of the road and instead of going and ministering to him, maybe he was on his way to temple, maybe like going back to what you said earlier, maybe he was trying to get to church because he, man, I got to get there in time for praise service. I got to get there in time so I can do this. And you done passed by somebody that's on the side of the road. You was on a mission that could have been divo- avoid, uh, uh, diverted to take care of a greater mission. That's right. These were religious leaders. Sometimes we can be so caught up in the religious thing that we're doing in the church that we really miss true opportunity. Because a lot of times when people rush to get to church, they want to be entertained. I got to get there before they get to this part of the service. You know, I can't miss the choir. I can't miss the prayer. I can't miss the And then wait a minute, man. There's something more important right now. And sometimes we lose sight of it. I'm not downplaying how important it is for us to come to church and worship, but what I'm trying to say is that sometimes we can't let coming to church prevent us from doing something that God has given us an opportunity to do on the way to church. Amen. And I'm not telling us that we got to be a sucker for everybody standing out there on the corner with a can in their hand and all that. But I think in the spirit will reveal to us when we can be a good Samaritan. Amen. He said, now look, a temple assistant walked by on walked over and looked at him lying there. But he also passed by on the other side. Mm -hmm. Two religious folk. Prayed the Lord all day on Sunday and then just passed by on the other side. So a need. Someone of their own race. Their own kind. And they passed him by on the other side. Now Jesus wrote the story for it so he can make the character be whoever he wanted to be. So Jesus, to get their attention, he, he, he knew he was going to hit a nerve by letting the guy who do the, the good deed be someone that wasn't a Jew. He knew that. Look at this. Then a despised, somebody say despised. Despised despise Samaritan, somebody that y'all look down on, y'all hate, y'all can't stand, came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Somebody who had a right to keep going because, hey, they hate us anyway, so seeing one of them down is good because that means that's one less that can hate us. I mean, that's how, you know, at a natural you would think, hey, they hate me, I hate them, so therefore one of them down, I ain't got time for him. His own folk done pass by, why in the world should I stop? I don't like him no way. Brother Fred, go ahead. That, piece, that, that priest could have been a hindrance to the assistant. Hey, look, he passed him by, so, and he's a priest, so why should I stop? Amen. Follow the leader. Amen. Now, look. He said, then a despised Samaritan came along and saw the man. He felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wound with oil and wine and bandaged him. them. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He walked instead of riding. And... He took him to an inn where they took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill bill runs higher, I will pay you the next time I'm here. Now he did all that for somebody that he didn't even know. 
but he was a good Samaritan. And from that event, that's how we came up with what we call in America the Good Samaritan Law. Whereas because that law is on the books, you now don't have to be fearful when you see someone in distress and you think they can need help and you go and try to administer first aid to them and they end up dying because they're going to die anyway, now they can't come back and sue you for being a good Samaritan. They put that law in the book so that people would not be afraid to help people because they thought they were going to get sued for trying to save somebody's life. And so in most nations around the world, they practice this good Samaritan law. And we practice it here in America on our books. So now that you know that, ain't nothing wrong with you helping someone who's in this stress. So look, he says. Now, now look what Jesus got him now. Now, which of the three would you say was a neighbor? He's finna make him answer his own question. Was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? See, you were smart and educated. You wanted to argue with me up before. Then you're going to ask me, who is a good neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now, I just gave you a story. Now, you answer this, your own question, who your neighbor is. And look, look what he said. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus says, now you little smart guy. Yes, now go and do the same. Do the same thing that you just learned. Add that to your repertoire of knowledge that now you can be a good Samaritan. You can show love to someone that may not love you. Because that is your neighbor. Love may cost you some time. It costs this good Samaritan some time, some resources. But in the end, God will bless you for being kind to people. Especially when they're less fortunate than you are and you're well able. We're almost done. Let me finish this real quick. Now Jesus transitioned, and he has this episode where he goes and visits Martha and Mary. Uh, and it says in verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. In other words, that was customary. They were friends of Jesus, so it wasn't like he was no complete stranger to them uh, because Lazarus was their brother. And so we're going to see Jesus will raise Lazarus from the dead later on. But so now Jesus entered into their home with his disciples. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. Now, man, that was a great honor for a woman to be able to sit in the presence of a rabbi and to be taught. That was an opportunity that a lot of women did not get in that day. So Mary said, hey, look here. We got the rabbi of rabbis in the house today. I'm going to stop everything I'm doing and go sit at his feet and see what I can learn. Right. Now, whereas Martha now wanted to be a good host, there ain't nothing wrong with being a good host, but she looked like she tried to do too much to impress Jesus with the natural things of life instead of taking the time to come and see what she can learn. From him. That's right. She had the opportunity, but instead of doing that, she get mad at her sister. Now look at this. Y'all in verse 40. So Mary was sitting down at his feet listening to what he taught. Jesus was a teacher. When you go to church, you need to be taught something. Amen. 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 But Martha was distracted. Somebody say distracted. There are a lot of people who come to church every Sunday uh, during the week. They just get this distracted. The devil will always throw things like that to distract you. You can get distracted doing busy work in the church that ain't got nothing to do with you learning what God wants you to do. Sometimes, you know, ushers need to sit down and learn. It's, it's 1130. Ain't nobody else coming in. Sit down. Get your notepad out. We, we know our trend. We know, our, we know how people come in. We know at a certain time they, they in. And if ain't one coming in, they'll figure it out. Sit down and try to learn stuff. I'm on duty. I got to say I'm on duty. No, you need to be sitting out trying to learn something. 
Amen. And sometimes we can get caught up in the things we do in church, man, and miss opportunities to learn. Look at said, now look. But Mary was distracted by the big dinner, big dinner. She was preparing. And what am wrong with that? She wanted to be a good, gracious host. I understand it. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair? Marvin and went and sit down on her post, listen to the word, and I'm still standing up here at the door letting folks in. It seemed un- seem unfair. Lord, that just seemed unfair. Now, it would be one thing if that was, she would stop right there, Finley, but because it was unfair, she took it personally and she got upset. You know, our kids not say, that ain't fair. Well, you know, God ain't had to be fair with you. What's fair to you may not be fair to God. Lord, doesn't that seem unfair to you that my sister just sit there here while I do all, all the way? <laughs> you do it because you want to. If you want to do it, don't complain about doing it. Amen. If, if you want to stand on the door, all the service and all that, then don't complain later. Well, you know, I wish I could have sit down. My feet was hurt. Well, look, you should have sit down. <laughs> Ain't nobody coming in. Sit down. I had to be in the kitchen the whole time. Well, the food was done. <laughs> Come out the kitchen and sit. I wish somebody could have been back here helping me fix this meal we're going to have. Sit down. The folk can wait. So if you're going to do it, then don't complain about it after you do it. Amen. Pastor telling you right now, if you're back there and the word start coming forth, sit. The folk who get in the word can be patient enough to wait till you get back in there after the word because they ought to appreciate the fact that you're going to sit down and get the word and not sit in the kitchen and listen to music instead of listening to the... Amen. Ain't nobody in here helping me. Well, you shouldn't be in there. <laughs> Sit down. Amen. <laughs> All right, now, now, y'all ain't got to do that strap. I'm just telling you what Jesus told. Look at it. You know what I mean? But I am warning you, don't come to me talking about it ain't fair. Pastor, it ain't fair. You did that on your own. <laughs> you, you, you did that because you wanted to do it. Can I, can, I, can I let me move on? Let me This is what she said about her sister. Lord, it doesn't, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister sit here while I do all? Whenever somebody uses the word all, I always hit them real hard right there. Don't come to me and say you do it all. Because that's absolute. You don't do it. You may do a lot, but you don't do it. Tell her to come and help me. Now you would have thought Jesus said, yeah, baby girl, you're so right. You know, Mary, you come on out of there. Go on and get in that kitchen with your sister. Go on and get in there. Get away from my feet. Go on and get in the kitchen with your sister. Your sister, your sister wants some help. Even though she done brought all this on her self. Look, look, Jesus was nice, man. Jesus was cool right here. I like this. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, hmm, mm, mm, you are worried and upset over all these details. Man, you focusing on the wrong thing. I ain't even asked for no sandwich. I ain't, I ain't even asked you for no sandwich yet. You know, yeah, you could have fixed the sandwich when I asked for it. I ain't even asked you for nothing. I just came in the house to teach a lesson. And now you done been out there and cooked the whole dinner. I ain't even asked you. You didn't even know whether or not I wanted to eat dinner today. But you were caught up in them details. She fixed a big dinner. He said, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Wow. And Mary has discovered it. And it will not be taken away from. Man, I ain't finna come down on her because she getting in, getting talk. I ain't finna take that away from her. That's what I came to do. I came to teach her about the kingdom. And she's sitting here trying to learn about the kingdom. And you're in there trying to get grits and eggs together. And I ain't even I ain't even ordered them yet. Get the lesson. Make and keep the first things first, man. Amen. Yes, we work in the church. Yes, we do things in the church. But there got to be a priority 
when it comes to the things that we do for the Lord. And part of that, we got to be taught this word. Amen. Man, it used to be a time in church, man, when the preacher got up to preach, everybody stopped and came and sit down to listen to what he had to say. Now people work, work right through the sermon. And ought to be a time when they stop. I ain't got no problem if people want to do that, but man, they got to get that word. And that's why in the old days we used to have CDs and all that. We used to give them to people and say, hey, at least listen to it. After now you can download it on your, on your podcast and all that. If you miss it, you can get the word. But man, sometimes you just want to be in the atmosphere when the word is coming forth. Amen. It just, just makes a difference Amen. when you're there. Brother Herb, and I'm about to, we're going to wrap it up because we've got two minutes. Well, the same thing is, is not just when you've been in the, in the place where they're going to bring forth the word, but I'm saying for your whole life, he's telling us to do the same thing on your whole life. You need to get into the presence of the Lord, you know, before your day start. You can't be worrying about the things in the world Amen. and forget about studying, getting in the word of the Lord. And in and and your life, I mean, your lifestyle, what I'm trying to say, daily, you need to be, you know, to get into the Lord. Amen. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't be worrying about things out in the world. And when you, when you do that, you're doing the same thing with like Mary. You're worrying about the things you have to do, but you're not getting into the word of God. Amen. So what I'm trying to say is your lifestyle, you got to do the same thing. Amen. It's getting into to have that, that lifestyle in your word. Amen. That's like Martha. Pastor. Like Martha. Pastor. Pastor, I mean, Martha. You know what I mean, like Martha. You yes, ma'am, Ms. Martha. I have Let's one stop. thing to say as we were studying this. My phone rang three times. And first time it went off, I didn't hit, I'll call you back. I just hit off. Second time it rang, I hit off. Second time, third time it rang, I hit off. And the spirit let me know, get up and go see what the phone call is about. It was somebody calling me to pray. And so sometimes we get caught up, we're in church, we don't know. I usually cut my phone off. But I thank God that I didn't because this young lady really needed prayer at that time. Her mother, uh, keep her lifted in prayer. It's Miss Judy's um, grandson's mother in hospice right now, not doing good. Amen. So she needed prayer. So I thank God for uh, letting me do that. But I was like, okay, I'm, I'm in church now. But that's a good word. I mean, I, I, I don't say that, yeah, that's different but, than fried eggs. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's that different from poke chops together for us, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good I word. I almost didn't do it because I said, I kept hitting it because I said, oh, she just want to talk about what's going on Saturday. And then the Lord said, get up and answer that phone call. Amen. So I did. So I thank God for that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, then, real quick, God, and I know good lesson now. I hope y'all got something out of it. Go back, read it for yourself. And again, how you interpret it. How do you understand what Jesus said? That even that episode with Mary and Martha, how do you understand that? It's going to be how you apply it.